Hello everyone and welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday the 7th of June. Our topic today is Earning Your Learning iPad Apps and Accessibility with show hosts Peggy George, Lori Moffat, and Tammy Moore. Thank you to Tammy for doing closed captioning today. I'm Lori Moffat. Our special guest is Tony Plurd and let's get to the content. Here's the Live Binder link and notice the tabs are on the left hand column of the Live Binder rather than across the top for the different resources. Peggy will be dropping links in the chat. I will be capturing questions that you may have for Tony from the chat. The recordings for the show are posted on the archives and resources page, which can be directly accessed with this link. And again, Peggy will post that in chat. Here is where we get a little interactive with the show. Uh, please pick that second tool down, the pointer tool, and click on the spot on the world map where you are logging in from. I'm logging in from central Pennsylvania. I know Peggy's logging in from Phoenix, Arizona. Tammy's logging in from southwest Arkansas. Tony's logging in from Alberta, Canada. Usually we have an international audience, and it looks like we do again today. And here's our first polling question. Have you taught students on the autism spectrum? So you vote with that little check in the box that's underneath your name in bold at the top. But you can also type your answer in chat. No, I have. I will then post those answers to the whiteboard. And out of those that have voted, 38% have. I'll clear those answers and ask the second question. Have you used iPads with special needs students in your classroom? And I'll wait until People have voted and then post the results. Sixty-one percent of those that have voted have not used iPads with special needs students. Our third question is, have you used UDL, Universal Design for Learning, to develop lesson plans units for your classroom? And then I'll publish those answers. Almost half, 42% of those that voted have used UDL. Again, I want to thank you for coming today for today's topic, Earning Your Learning, iPad Apps and Accessibility. Our special guest is Tony Plurd, and Tony is an educational assistant in Livingstone Range School Division, Alberta, Canada. She's a transplanted Texan 
and she's a geek that wants to use the best of tech to help the struggling learner. Uh, our 21st century learners have more than games to play. They have tools to tutor themselves and grow their expertise. She's been involved in special needs, one-to-one -one mentoring and assisting for 12 years in the school division, guiding students from ages 3 to 15 with autism, Down syndrome, and cere cerebral palsy, including four years' experience with the iPad helping these individual learners succeed. Her favorite quote is, education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. And she says, let the pyromania begin. So Tony, welcome. Here's the newbie question. What is accessibility? And I'll turn the show over to you. Thank you very much, Lori. I'm really happy to be here. And I am. I'll ask you that question. There are um, many means for making something usable by everybody, so including people with disabilities. So finding ways to remove barriers to learning is what we're going to talk about today. So there we go. So I'll I'll just go to my next slide. Is that correct? There we go. Earning the learning uh, is something that I thought about um, because so often iPads were looked at as toys to play games with. Uh, sometimes they were learning games and that sort of thing. And so I, I really looked into that a little more. I, I believe that instead of just games to play or, or computer time, you know, as, as a recreation time or a break from regular classroom learning, I think of the iPad as the actual tool that is going to enhance learning, that that's something to use on a more consistent basis, especially with our autistic students and other visual learners who need something concrete, a visual picture showing exactly what, what they are learning, what they need. So I think of it more as a teaching tool where they grow their own expertise and uh, involve themselves in their own learning and become uh, more engaged in their own learning. Um, let me see. Yeah, the, um, the iPad, I believe, is, is a, um, it's a cool tool factor to help break down some of those barriers that others may see towards those with special needs. Uh, when uh, you know, a special needs child has an iPad and knows how to use it, they're a pretty cool dude. And uh, it's something you know, encouraging others to interact with our special needs kids. I think as we get familiar enough with the device, um, you're, it's, it becomes more about the content and what you're learning and less about trying out the new technology because it becomes so familiar. Um, such things as like reading an ebook and getting a word definition. Um, you know, any of you that have e-readers or that sort of thing, this is one of the modern uses of technology to help people with their learning. Or even like content creation, creating an ebook to tell your story or viewpoint. Well, here's the slide now on high definition fiber tracking. Um, this is an MRI-based technology that makes um, pictures of the circuits and the connections in your brain. Uh, Dr. Walter Schneider of uh, the Research and Development Center in Pittsburgh has been doing some really innovative work with this HDFT. Um, he approached Temple Grandin um, about doing a brain scan to see what it was that made her different. She is uh, an inspiration to many. She has her PhD, is a university professor, a successful businesswoman in the, the, um, in the um, agricultural world, and she is autistic. She didn't speak until she was four years old, and her mother insisted um, back in the 1940s on intense daily early therapy for this young daughter of hers. Her mother always said that she was different but not less. Temple Grandin thrives on her visual memory. And I had an aha moment when I came across Dr. Schneider's 
um, information. He found that Temple Grandin's motor to visual brain connection are 10 times that of a normal, typically developing brain. So you'll see here, I'm just going to get the pointer. You'll see here, this is Temple's brain. This, this, uh, this part here is 10 times that of a normal, develop, typically developing brain. And he also noticed that her visual auditory naming connections, the thing in the blue, is uh, 10 times less developed than that of a typical developing brain. So he concluded from that her visual learning capacity outstripped her ability to use communication. And this, this research is in its infancy. Um, but I just I wanted to note that there is on 60 Minutes uh, some video on some of the research that he's done and what that means for our autistic children today. Um, there are, like I said, links in the live binder today. So anything that we show on here today will be in the live binder. This is some links that I've left in the live binder. Um, a TED Talk by Temple Grandin, her latest book on autism. Um, she's also done other books like Thinking in Pictures. She explained that, um, that for her, thinking in pictures literally means that there are movies going in her head. Her mind, she said, works like Google Images. If you mention something, say, uh, you know, roses, She'll see a variety of color of roses, roses in a garden, roses in a, in a, you know, in somebody, in a specific neighbor's garden, in a place like Bouchard Gardens, is, you know, famous gardens all over the world, that sort of thing. So she thinks in pictures when she hear, hears words. Um, there was an interview here. There's a, Pinterest. There's lots to explore about autism from an expert who can be very informative. She's so articulate. It's very wonderful to have uh, to have listened to her. Now, autism and the iPad. Um, there is the power of tech tools is vital to our visual learners, as I said, for enhancing their communication their socialization, and their education. This young man's name is Chase. And he and I started together when he was three and a half years old. And I was his PA until he turned 11. Uh, so I had eight years with him. He started out as a nonverbal child and grew into his abilities to communicate and read over time. We used both low tech and high tech to accomplish his goals. Um, before the iPad came along, um, you know, there was other um, like text communication tools, um, board maker, that sort of thing. And uh, you know, I continue to recommend those because so much of his ability to help me to understand what he want, even at a young age was the ability to point to pictures or to bring objects and that sort of thing. It, it was very interesting getting to know him. And, and certainly, we grew to uh, understand one another very well. He still um, is somewhat nonverbal, but definitely knows how to communicate his desires. And uh, the other day, I even called up his mom to ask permission to use him in, a, in our presentation. And she was happy for that. And she said, um, here, let me give you Chase. And he talked to me on the phone. Um, some of these moments just give you tr thrills um, to know that there is you know, accomplishment. It takes many, many years, lots and lots of little teeny tiny goals. And then you can accomplish these things. Um, well, one of our first uh, main goals besides communication was even toilet training. So after he was out of pull-ups and into uh, underwear, that was a process. And it, it took quite a while. It took about three years. Um, 
but he blossomed. He finally blossomed when we caught on to the need for him to have a personalized social story, it's one with his pictures in it. Um, a lot of autistic students don't generalize. If they see a picture of a person, you know, ready to go to the toilet, they uh, they say, oh, that that's in their head. It's oh, that's that person. They don't generalize it to mean, oh, I should go too. I showed him many times. I shared with him a book about, you know, quote unquote, going to the potty, and and where it was, and and what the the tools were that you needed, the toilet, that that sort of thing, uh, pulling down your pants. He he kind of got it, but not really. I mean, I would even sing catchy little tunes quietly in his ear. It's time to go potty, you know, that sort of thing. He finally caught on at six and a half years old because we made a book with his picture in it and his cue words with the step-by-step -step instructions. So a photograph of me um, saying, I will ask teacher Tony when I need to go to the washroom. A photograph of the washroom door. Here is the washroom. Um, sorry, in Canada we say washroom. It's restroom everywhere else, and I'm not sure all over the world. <laughs> um, but you know, and then we'd have a picture of him sitting on the toilet with his pants down. Um, and of course, we kept this a uh, private book just between him and I. Um, and then a picture of him using the toilet paper, and a, a picture of him, uh, or a picture of him holding toilet paper, a picture of him washing his hands. And within four months, he was completely potty trained after giving him a personalized story about himself. So that really gave me an aha moment. You know, these are things that we need to do. So with uh, visual learners on the autism spectrum, they always make that better progress when you can see, when they can see exactly what you're talking about. Um, just a list here. We use uh, for the iPad. We use numeracy and literacy apps for his just right levels. I would show co accomplishments for social time together. He would see himself again in a social story, having positive interactions with other members of the classroom. He'd learn their names. He'd learn the you know, and all the while he never not really was catching on how to ask them questions or do things with them. Now this was, uh, I was done with our time together about two years ago, so I'm not sure what's been accomplished since then, but him even talking to me on the phone, uh, you know, a sentence or two was an amazing accomplishment. So I'm sure he has gone on to do other things as well. So I use the iPad for classroom rules and visual schedules field trip preparation and expectations, social stories, and more. So here is a picture of one of his accomplishments. Um, you'll notice here, just with ease, using the scissors, he is 10 years old by this time. And uh, from kindergarten on, I would do hand over hand, helping him to learn how to use scissors or a pencil. Um, and early on, even as as a four-year-old, I was uh, reading to him books uh, and, and tracking with my finger so he got used to the left to right um, uh, tracking. Um, so when I, when I look at this picture, I am so filled with joy because it took uh, almost, uh, I mean, it took a good four years for him to grasp on to the desire and the ability and to overcome his touch sensitivities, you know, having to hold things in his hand, uh, for him to be able to make this craft. And uh, for instance, his uh, he hurt his hand uh, writing one day, really hurt his hand, and, and pulled it away, and and cried a bit. And and um, I was hand over hand with him writing his name. Well, that was in kindergarten. He didn't even like picking up a pencil for two more years. I couldn't really persuade him. I would con continue to offer, but he did not willingly take a pencil for another two years after that happened. So for me, seeing this accomplishment of him 
making his own drawing his own Batman and pictures and symbols and cutting them out, making the belt uh, and the mask. These things were wonderful. And I think the only thing I did was tie tie on the, the uh, cape there. So yeah, um, field trip preparation. Um, pictures that I would do beforehand would be of students lining up and how we line up. That was another issue that we dealt with, trying to help him to integrate into a group situation and, and make sure he had his backpack and was responsible for the things that other typically developing students would also be responsible for. So just making it concrete with the picture story. No, when we got there, taking pictures of him with students and doing the things that we do, um, I could make a social story afterwards and we would review some of these things. We could label things, but mo more importantly, uh, having the opportunity to discuss um, um, who he was with and how that person helped him and how thankful he was to be able to have help building uh, building this uh, um, covered wagon. It was a part in many, many pieces and the students put them together like Legos um, and have quite a lot of fun. So yes, being able to help him learn to to label his emotions and be aware of his emotions and be able to talk about those emotions. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Yeah. I mean, things like, are you interested? Were you bored? Are you happy? Are you grumpy? Were you hungry here? What did you have for lunch? Who did you sit with while you had lunch? And um, one of the other things that uh, works really well is, um, here is, uh, time with friends. This didn't always happen and in this day, you know, anytime I could catch him um, with with friends reading or what have you, then definitely we'd get photographs of those so we could go over it again and again in these social stories and remind him of the good feelings he had and the fun he had while he, and the peace that he had while he was interacting with another companion. <coughs> Excuse me. So that, that brings me, yes, to calming positive activities um, that helped him to remember what it was like <laughs> to feel calm because there were many times throughout the day when there was, it was just noisy and uh, there are rules and there are other people you know, with their needs and, uh, for instance, going into an assembly in the gym or taking part in gym time was, he was quite averse to this for many years and we had to engage him and do uh, different kinds of things, staying on the perimeter of the activities and letting him observe and feel better about these things and then being able to talk about them later uh, in social stories. Um, one of the social stories that I put together as he was older was, what can I say? I used this symbol um, as, his, um, as his symbol to learn that he can engage in conversation between two people. Now these are stick figures and sometimes it w we found it was even better to have an actual picture of him and another student talking. And if there were friends that he tended to gravitate to, we'd put him and say three or four of those friends and get four different pictures, him and one friend, so that he could could get into his mind, you know, write that file to the brain that said, oh, I'm talking to AJ, I'm talking to Levi, you know, that sort of thing. So what I did was make a movie with Windows Movie Maker and included um, this uh, icon and then asked, what can I say? Sometimes I want to spend time with friends. Um, and it said, one, one, file, one frame of the video would say, can I draw with you? And he'd have his, the next frame would be a picture of his favorite friend who would like to draw um, superheroes for him. Oh, that was a great activity together. So just getting him to learn chunks of scripted sentences so that he would have the vocabulary, um, I found that he could, 
he could talk physically and be understood very well when he did talk, but drawing that out of him, he needed some prompting. Another one was, can I eat lunch with you? Can I play with you? So as he grew in his ability to use these sentences and make that connection that he could go and talk to someone to, to initiate conversation, that, that really helped. So that was a social story movie that I made. Um, let's see here. Oh, and that brings us to, uh, to a really neat cartoon. <laughs> my learning support teacher put this all around the school. And it so reminds me of my student now, who is a very smart young man with cerebral palsy in a power wheelchair. Um, here, here he says, could you please shovel the ramp? And here the janitor, all these other kids are waiting to use the stairs. When I get through shoveling them off, I'll cl I will clear a path on the ramp for you. And, uh, but if you shovel the ramp, we can all get in. And it's so true to form. Clearing a path for people with special needs really does clear a path for everyone. And that's where our universal design for learning comes in. Um, let's see here. I wanted to, to give a little definition for it because some of us have, haven't uh, been familiar with it. It is a set of principles for curriculum development that give all individuals equal opportunity to learn. So uh, off of their website, uh, the cast.org website, they, uh, they say that it's a blueprint for creating instructional goals, methods, materials, and assessments that work for everyone. I really like that they say it's, it's not a single one-size-fits-all solution, but a flexible approaches for customizing and adjusting to individual needs. Um, we know that, and you know, individuals have a variety of skills and needs and interests, and and even in neuroscience, it's showing that there are different parts of the brain that are unique uh, to individuals, and that goes for everyone. Um, so there are um, multiple means of representation when you have your learning. That's the uh, what of learning. You know, how we gather facts and core, uh, categorize what we see and hear and read. So that would be like identifying letters or words or uh, a, an author's style is that part. So the what of what we learn, multiple means of representation. There is also multiple means of action and expression. So planning and performing tasks, you know, how, how we organize and express our ideas writing an essay or uh, solving a math problem. Those are strategic uh, tasks. And then multiple means of engagement. Uh, how do we as learners engage and stay motivated? How are we challenged and excited and interested? And I'm sure that each of us in our own way uh, throughout our own educations have learned what is it that really sparks our fire, you know? Um, let me just move my page here. Yeah. So the what of learning is principle one. The how of learning is principle two. And the why of learning is principle three. I'd like to share right quick a, an app with you. It is also going to be on our, uh, it's going to be on our um, live binder link today. But this is something I've enjoyed getting to know here. All right, so this is a wheel that, based on the principles that we just talked about, you can find out information to um, guide your uh, lessons instructions and the ways that you can meet the needs of all your learners. Um, here we go with uh, options for perception. Um, let's see, I'll just turn it. Oh, options for self-regulation options for perception, and then they have below, they do have some uh, additional online resources, suggestions and resources. Um, one that I wanted to share today, options for language and symbols. I clicked on define vocabulary and symbols and came up with visual words. I really, really like this. For instance, if I put a, a word in, say jump, 
and uh, a visual learner can decide, you know, on what what things that they are looking for. Is it jump and leap? So they get a definition for that. Is it, uh, you know, startle and jump? Uh, move suddenly, and then they use it in a sentence. What is really unique about this, I think, is you'll notice, say, these color coding. Um, the verbs are in green, just like it says here. Uh, nouns, you've got adjectives, adverbs, like rough, rocky, bumpy, jolty. This is uh, uh, the, uh, sorry, the adjectives. Right. And, um, connections, any of these connections, they can be, is a kind, for instance, these blue uh, symbols, is a kind of, so a capriole is a kind of jump for a trained horse. So this is a way of visualizing different words and how to use them. I thought that was a really interesting tool. But uh, yeah, that will be also on our uh, life binder. So I will and the web sharing there and go back to our slides. There we go. And uh, yes, I did find another one that's also bookmarked in our live binder called Science Update. And it was small, just three to five minute uh, webcast describing uh, certain aspects of the brain. Um, podcasts, you know, little things that are, say, learners with dyslexia would really like to delve into a topic more, but their reading capabilities might be holding them back. So a learner with that barrier, it can be overcome by listening to short podcasts and then reporting on it. Uh, I would say even in the iPad, there are many apps for recording uh, your voice and having it, you know, tech, uh, speech to text. And another good use for the iPad. That brings us to Symbaloo. Um, I just turned on my page here. Symbaloo is an awesome, awesome tool for visual bookmarking. Each of these tiles that you see are a bookmarked website that will take you to that particular um, tool. For me, this one is called iPad in Class, and I've bookmarked several Excuse me. I bookmarked several uh, apps that I used on a, you know, have used in the past and on a daily basis, and have recommended to other other uh, TAs or teachers using apps with students. These these are there's so many I can't go over them all today. But Symbaloo is free. Um, you can make an um, um, educational uh, account. Um, it's it's a wonderful tool. I, I like it for the primary grades even for all learners. I, I believe that, you know, how you go in and if you have young learners, they spend a lot of time trying to type in the right website. And with something, a tool like Symbaloo, that can come up on their, be bookmarked as their home screen and the teacher has control over you know, oh, I want you to go here today, or I want you to go here today, that sort of thing. So I believe that this Symbaloo um, tool is wonderful as a universal design for learning tool. Um, the iPad for apps here and all of these columns here go from primary down to what I'm using in the high school right now with my uh, grade 10 student. Um, these things are bookmarked app so it'll take you right to iTunes so that you can can download that app right away. Um, this section right here is other educators and uh, the way that they use the iPad with with uh, special needs students and here are some more on autism special needs and using these apps. So lots of references for you today. We're only going to go over these four right here today. Um, and we will do that later. Another uh, thing that I found I love by Kendra Grant of Sublime Learning is this Symbaloom bit, a web mix called the UDL Playground. Um, she took, for instance, perception and found that this voice dream reader 
uh, bookmark that for us and then also bookmark the tutorial. I completely have enjoyed the voice dream reader um, because of it, it's a text to speech in a natural sounding app, a uh, natural sounding voice and it ha it's it's ten dollars, but it's well worth it. It takes your PDF files from several sources, such as Google Docs, uh, Google Drive, or um, the Daisy um, bookmarks. There's like oh, there's five or six places that you can pull your PDF files from, and then you can adjust the reading and listening speeds. Uh, the words are highlighted as the reading goes on, and they have a variety of fonts and other options. Uh, the one I'm really interested in and have used is the Open Dyslexia font. It's for readers who find letters confusing. And uh, uh, I, I explain everything is an app that I use every day with my student. Uh, who is um, with cerebral palsy, and uh, I'll explain that a little later on. But this I highly recommend to go in and look at it and uh, and uh, use some of the UDL opportunities to break down those barriers for learning. Um, here we are with the the four that I'm going to highlight today, and uh, Story Creator Pro, Prezi can be uh, used on the web or as an app on the iPad, Bitsboard Pro, and Book Creator Pro. So this Prezi um, is called the Jumping Spider. And Chase and I were uh, researching an animal. And that was the assignment in the class as a grade uh, 5 student. Um, having a visual presentation uh, definitely helped him a lot more and kept him engaged. Uh, Prezi's are wonderful because they move around. They are like PowerPoint slides, but the slides can move all around the campus, the canvas, and um, and um, are very engaging. And you can have um, live videos or you know videos downloaded to it, uploaded to your Prezi as well. Um, if you want to try that out, mine is uh, called Earning the Learning, and that is also a link. Um, on the live binder, and so yeah, if you want to check out how uh, Prezi works. Now, I decided to use it also as an ebook, so uh, I would save my Prezi as a PDF. There's a link here, a great tutorial for you know quick and easy uh, saving your PDF. Um, we uh, you can print it or view it on the computer again when you don't have internet access or if you wanted to limit that. Uh, you can import it. You can import your PowerPoint files. If you've already got some great ebooks together for students, um, they can be imported and they can view um, view the it on a, a moving uh, zooming platform. Uh, for for educators and students with a school email, it is five hundred megabytes of storage. Uh, you can get free hundred megabytes for the general public. Uh, we upgraded my uh, student with a cerebral palsy. My current student and I both have the 500 megabytes in order to uh, for him to use for his presentation. He finds that that is a great way to interact with his classroom and to accomplish his assignments. Um, this is Nick. And uh, the way we use the iPad together is uh, I have a closed circuit TV. And this, we found that the laptop was too small for him to actually see it. This has been a great benefit. Um, and m many things I can do on the laptop on websites. But when I need to go and do worksheets with him, I'll use the, uh, the iPad in Explain Everything, which is a, a whiteboard app. I can download his worksheets, say for Romeo and Juliet, or math worksheets, I can answer questions. He can answer the questions and then I can type them in or uh, do text-to-speech with the iPad 3. Um, iPad 2s will do not have the text-to-speech uh, built into the, to the keyboard, but iPad 3 and greater do have that built in. So that does save us some time and keep us going uh, 
more quickly in his assignments. He is a Dash 1 student, meaning that he is preparing for university. Um, and ha has the expectation and the pace of all students in, in his uh, classroom. So uh, we are given additional time, and the iPad helps us speed that up. Um, I can speak uh, you know, into the dictation, and it will type it up in lightning speed much faster than I can handwrite or, uh, or even type on the computer. Um, for math problems, I can continue to use the whiteboard app and write out the problems. And it just makes it much faster. Everything I do on the iPad is done with AirPlay. And screen it, it goes to the laptop screen. And this screen is um, hooked into the uh, closed circuit TV. Yeah. Here is another use of the Prezi. Uh, Chase and I along with the class, went to the airport. We had a day at Spaceport, which um, had different rides um, that, that simulated being out in space, or an old plane that was um, able for kids to go in and experience what it's like to be in a, in a plane. He had some great opportunities on this day. He was able to give his own money for his lunch and receive the change. And he got to sit with you know, his favorite um, uh, um, student teacher who organized this trip for us. And although he couldn't personally stay in, um, in the class room setting where they were talking about aerodynamics and how the air goes across uh, you know, wings and that sort of thing. It was just well above uh, his head as a student. We still made it an opportunity of a learning day. Um, one, one use of it was, you know, like I said again, how he felt and what was his favorite tool, you know, what was his favorite activity, and, and even learning to use the escalator. I had pictures of that. Uh, he, this was a first for Chase. Um, because of his being older, I didn't go with him to the washroom in the ladies' room because we were in public. So he had a first. He had a student, several students go with him. And he, he knew what to do, and then, you know, but the, he was still uh, felt inside that um, bubble of familiarity because he had students to be with him, and I waited outside the door. So, uh, yeah, the only, the only new thing that caused a little bit of a fracas for him was using the water to wash his hands. He was unfamiliar with it, and, and it scared him, and he screamed. <laughs> so you know, it all, it's all about learning, and uh, it's, it's a bumpy road sometimes. I know the pictures in the social story show that it's, uh, it looks easy, but, but it's not. Um, I will continue. I see our time is, is uh, getting getting on here. So this was an awesome athlete that I had an opportunity to work with on his writing and his writing practice. Um, he definitely was behind in several years in, in his abilities uh, with his peers. And using the Prezi presentation allowed him to come out of his shell. Um, I mean, he's a, you know, a popular athlete in the class, and but, but to be able to break that down that barrier with his writing. And he would choose his own pictures, put his own words to it. At that time, he was unfortunately very shy, incredibly shy, about sharing it with students. Um, but as we, he did share it with the teacher. And uh, when we went on to do more, he would do humorous ones, even about zombies and, and uh, it was such a aha, wonderful day, wonderful moment when he pulled three friends over and shared his Prezi with them. And it's such a wonderful tool. Um, in order to uh, download them as, as a PDF, I'll just show you. There's a share button here and download as PDF. And then you follow the directions to use that. All right. Story Creator Pro is not very expensive. and it's easy for lots of learners. What's really nice is it's customizable. A recorder, 
you record the student's own voice, they type up the text, they have an image. Um, what's nice is the text is highlighted while they are listening to it be read back to them. And there's drawing tools available and stickers. So here's one that he did about science. Uh, I read for 10 minutes and then I write. He, um, he did a five or six page book. And this is uh, one of our young men on the autism spectrum who is trying to stay up to um, you know his grade level. And I find that this tool was so motivating for him. And I believe that as he read it back to me, he was learning and growing in his speech abilities and, and uh, that sort of thing. So very valuable UDL tool. Um, here you're seeing the the edit the recording. And right here, uh, you know, I read for 10 minutes. So each word is one button. And I needed to go in and put the button along with the speech. And you can hear it played back to you. And you press down on a button and move it, you know, to where that word is. So, so once you get it like you like it and you close it up, when it is the story is being read back to you, each word is highlighted at the right time that it's being spoken. Just a really simple tool um, and, and easy for our students to learn how to use. Bitsboard Pro. I thought I had found the mother load of games when I found Bitsboard Pro. It, it, uh, it does have a free version, uh, but it is so worth it. Customizable to any level of K-12. to It has 18 games reading games, matching games, um, choosing, uh, like for autistic students, uh, choosing what a group of pictures, what is the thing that is being talked about, you know, that sort of thing. So what's nice is it can have multiple accounts. So many students can use the one iPad. Um, and, and it tracks the student data to see what you know, how they're, which words they're getting right. You match visual, visual cues with words. You can use the student's voice to personal, you know, to personalize those cards. Um, there are many free collections, so you don't feel like you have to go out and do your own or spend a lot of time. There's free collections, emotions, literacy, numeracy, vocabulary. Um, I like the way the flashcards um, can be personalized by using the camera in, in the, in the iPad. Book Creator Pro, another one. I won't have time to go over this as much, but this is the, the re, uh, a review by Sylvia um, Rosenthal Tolisano. So you, she analyzed the Book Creator app and how it stands up pedagogically through curriculum connections, differentiation, personalization, personal learning, authenticity. Uh, so I highly recommend uh, searching her, her information on that. Here is the book creator. Um, once I, I made my, my book, I wanted to share it. I wanted to download it. So right down here is the export, the, the EPUB book. And I chose export as a PDF. And then when I chose that, it, it asked me which app. And I chose the uh, iBooks. Um, could be in your Google Drive as well. And when you get to it, it looks like this. So then it was saved. Now, if we're using one iPad, um, right here where it says collections, you can add collections. And I would add collections by student name. And then as they do their ebook, it can be in their file. Now, other students can see it um, and then read it, you know, that sort of thing with the one iPad. iPad accessibility features. This is, you know, my favorite, favorite, favorite number one thing for using with students when we're trying to keep them focused. Uh, the iPad has many wonderful accessibility features for you know vision and making text bigger, that sort of thing, speaking the text aloud. Um, but this guided access was made specifically to help um, students who don't focus, who would touch buttons and go in and out of, of the apps and not really concentrate on the lesson for the day. So if you will go to settings 
and then go to General, Accessibility, and then Guided Access. So here you can see there's General, and then here is Accessibility. Once you click there, it'll take you to all the accessibility lists of settings that you can change, and the one Guided Access right here. Um, you want to make sure, let's see, yeah. Um, what I was thinking is if you go down the page, guided access is right here, but you have to scroll till you get you know halfway down the page. And then once you click on that, it'll open this up and you'll want to turn on guided access, the set the passcode and turn on accessibility shortcut. So I'm going to give you a demonstration here with the Model Me Kids Social Stories. This is a free app and well worth it. Once I triple click on the physical home button, you will have this screen come up on your iPad. It is, um, it is getting you to enter into uh, the guided access for this particular app. Um, and then you, know, you can set some settings and then start. Here is some of the settings that you would want. Um, when you click on options, you can you can either allow the student to turn off the iPad and or and work with the volume buttons. I know for one of our students with autism, we wanted him to read the story al aloud to us rather than choosing uh, you know auto read. So what we did was turn the volume all the way down and then we turned off the volume button. It was no longer green and he would have to read it out loud because um, he had no other option. <laughs> so you can allow for touch, for motion, that sort of thing. One other feature is um, if you circle uh, an app, it will gray out that app and it is no longer available to be used. This one was a social story about going to the hairdresser. When our student had done this one 10, 20, 30 times, we were ready for him to move on to the mall or the doctor, you know, anything but the hairdresser. So um, that is a, an aspect that you can, you can do. Nice option. So like I said, you triple click the home button. Uh, this, this now, if you wanted to end your session, you would all Again, triple click the physical home button. That's the, the button uh, with the uh, circle and a square right on your, on your iPad. And then you would enter the passcode and then you would click on end, which is right here. If, uh, if you just wanted to adjust your options, you wouldn't click on end. At that point, you would adjust your options and then click on, on resume right here. Yeah. So that was quick. Um, last thing, projecting the iPad to another screen, the smart board, or in my case, my student needing to see his work from the iPad onto the laptop uh, or onto uh, you know your own your own desktop computer. There is something that you use called AirPlay and Air Server. They work together. AirPlay is found on the iPad at the bottom in the control center. Um, Air Server is the receiver for the AirPlay. So this program at airserver.com is downloaded to your own PC or your Mac, and then your iPad can communicate, you know, can show up on a screen because you have downloaded the Air Server. Quite inexpensive. I think I paid fourteen dollars to have it on five different machines. Um, so if you're projecting to a screen, like I said, this is the control center in the iOS seven. You would see the symbol AirPlay. Click on AirPlay, and it comes up as iPad, or for instance, my PC here. And I would click on the PC, and I would make sure that the mirroring button was on. And then voila, there you have it. It's that easy, that simple. It goes to your to your computer or your smart board. The um, the the main thing is that the air server and the computer have to be on the same Wi-Fi network in order for that to work. And it works just I mean if you have an Apple TV in your room, that's fine. I find that in our school we only had it in one room, so I needed it on my students' main laptop.
So thank you so much for being here today. I hope if you have any questions, you can contact me. There you go. I'll turn the time back over. Thank you so much, Tony. I did catch some questions, so we'll start at the beginning. This, go, this is going back to the personalizing stories. Uh, it seems like personalizing may be a way to deal with other behaviors like bullying. Yes, I believe so, definitely. That would definitely be the way to help. I think you know sometimes that bullying comes up because they don't know that this person is a real person. They see that autistic person as somebody who's not communicating, that's n just not quite you know, like them. And so breaking down those barriers by working together, by having a social story, creating positive interactions between others. It, I hope that answers your question. I'm not sure if that was it. Yeah, I think it did. Good. Uh, this, this question just came in, and I'll go back to my list. What did you try that didn't work, or what were failures, and how did you handle that? OK. Wow. Um, you know, nothing comes to mind right at this mm -hmm. moment, because mm -hmm. for me, a failure isn't, you know, a failure just feels like, you know, I can't go on. I never, I never felt like that. I felt like we had stepping stones. Mm -hmm. And if we if we came to some kind of a roadblock, then definitely we we overcame it. One of the roadblocks was the behavior of saying no out loud every time a request was asked of him. So we went back to the drawing board many times. Um, even if he'd say no, he'd go and do the thing that we asked. But there was a file written in his head somehow that to proceed with the behavior, he always had to say no first. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you know, those difficulties come up when they're autistic and they are just specifically they're remembering a situation and then and then they keep doing it the same way, that behavior. Failures. Um, yeah, I I would say that Sometimes, you know, getting enough pictures could be maybe considered a failure because mm -hmm. you, you have to take, you know, maybe, I don't know, 15 to 20 pictures of a situation and you might use two or three. So I always had a camera right handy and was always clicking. Um, mm -hmm. So sometimes that, you know, if, if another student mm -hmm. was uncomfortable with that, I would I would say that would be something, you know, finding out permission from other students. Can I, you know, take your picture with with my student, can you read with my student, or you know, uh, or can you read with Chase? You know that sort of thing. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, back to the early ones. Um, is Voice Dream a better option than subtext, a subtext app, or is it for a different purpose? Now, I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with subtext apps. Um, Maybe there's a specific one. I'd love to look, check it out, though. But Voice Dream has been fantastic for students, especially with uh, learning lags, to keep up with curriculum because uh, whatever the assignment is, is read out loud to them. Mm -hmm. They can follow the text as it goes along and encourage that, you know, getting that um, reading fluency in. And you can slow it, really slow it down. I've even turned the volume off slowed it way down to like 50 words per minute, which would be agonizing if you had to listen to it. <laughs> but it slowed it down enough that the person could then read along and read out loud. And we mm -hmm. could stop it, you know, stop it if we needed to work on a word, you know, that sort of thing. Great. Uh, does AirPlay work with Apple TV? It does. In fact, that's what it was designed okay. for. Right. And that's mm -hmm. what I guess, but I mm -hmm. captured the question anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to put the text in Voice Stream, is that correct? Uh, yes, you, you import it from, like I said, Google Drive. Um, you can import it from other ebooks, other apps in, in your, yeah. And mm -hmm. like the, the Canadian, the CNIB, which is for the blind, uh, they've recommended it. They've got Daisy Book. And those can be imported. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of things. Yeah, great. I think those were the questions that I captured that were not answered. Um, 
So I think it's time to move on past questions unless somebody has a question that they'd like to ask now, either on the mic or in chat. Thank you, everyone. I just so enjoyed my time today. Thank you. And I hope it has been helpful. And if you do have other questions, don't hesitate to email me. That would be just fine. Actually, somebody's in the process of asking a question about teaching a new app, but didn't finish the question. Yeah, that's a, that's probably a whole other talk. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I would think I would think so too. App. Yeah, <laughs> just te teaching an app. Right. I would mm -hmm. think so too. Uh, yeah. I would experiment with what that student needs. Um, you know, there are lower learning disabilities. There's higher functioning. Um, but if you can teach one specific piece of it of the app. Uh, you know how to uh, turn on the ebook, mm -hmm. and then as a as a teacher or a TA, then work the rest of the app for the student mm -hmm. uh, and and let them read. And then if if you need to, you know, the next time, the next few sessions you're together on that app, then you would let him take over the next or hers take over the next couple mm -hmm. of. Functions to, on the app and build yeah. a little bit at a time. It sounds like exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Was your student actually manipulating the iPad? Was Chase actually manipulating he the was. iPad? He was. He was. Yes. He was. He was. He got very good. We were doing some math. Mm -hmm. um, he got very good at, at choosing. You know, uh, five plus two is seven, and mm -hmm. finding the seven out of you know the four that were going by. Oh, know, right, right. The four fish. Yeah. So he was getting very good at that. Yes. Terrific. I think those were the last questions, so I'm going to turn the mic over. To, and thanks so much, Tony. I'll turn the mic over to Peggy for the upcoming shows. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Tony. It has been so helpful not only to have you share your wonderful resources, but to guide us through them and, and help us understand some of the important things that we need to think about not only for autistic students, but for all students. So thanks a lot. I want to invite all of you to join us next Saturday when Jeff Bradbury is going to be with us. So many people have asked for more information about how do you use Evernote in the classroom. Well, Jeff is going to spend the whole show telling us all of these amazing things you can do with Evernote. Then our next one webinars on a Thursday evening and not Saturday. And that's because we want to do a really special show with Live Binders where they are going to announce the winners of the top 10 Live Binders for ePortfolios. And that time is actually going to be 5 p.m. Pacific time. So just to go to this slide, I put a link in the Live Binder for this so you can get all the details. If you have created a Live Binder as an ePortfolio, whether it's a tutorial or an actual ePortfolio, please enter it in the contest. They have some amazing prizes. And on this webinar, they're going to be sharing with all of us the winners and inviting them to come on and share their own live binder. So that's June 19th, Thursday evening, and it's uh, 4 p.m. PST, 6 p.m. CST. So all those details are in the live binder. Also, just to jump back one more time, I want to remind all of you that we are going on summer break with Classroom 2O Live. So many of us will be at ISTE uh, at the end of June. And if you're there, be sure to come and find me. I would love to meet up face to face with any of you that are there. On um, Sunday, June 29th, um, Jeff is going to be interviewing me and anyone else who might be there for the 
to tell about our show. And so if you happen to be there, come and join us. I'd love to have you um, chat in that interview. It'll just be short and, and very informal, nothing to prepare, just show up. And that is, um, uh, it will probably be about maybe 20 minutes long, something like that. Um, 20 to 30 minutes max, I think. Um, so please come and join us. And Jeff is going to be uh, broadcasting these interviews for anyone that can't go to ISTE every morning from 9 to 12 Eastern Time. He's going to be interviewing speakers and programs and tools and all kinds of things. And you can find it on um, the uh, TeacherCast.tv or his YouTube channel. So come and join us. Also, we will be returning to our own Saturday live shows on August 2nd. So I know we'll all keep in touch virtually over the summer, but I just want you to be aware that that break is coming up. And now back to you, Lori. Thank you, Peggy. Uh, the Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's newest venture. He's gathered together all of his teacher professional development resources in one place, including the Host Your Own Webinar, uh, those of you that remember Illuminate and the Learn Central area, Host Your Own Webinar was there. Um, and that allows you to have access to a collaborate room for free as long as you make your webinar public. You can nominate a featured teacher at this link, tinyurl.com slash cr20live featured teacher nominate without the e at the end. And uh, you can even nominate yourself for the featured teacher of the month. Just fill out the form at that web address. When you exit the show, you will get the link for the survey that will automatically come up into your browser. So even if you're watching the recording, you can get the link for the survey. Uh, it will be in the chat log here shortly. The link is also in the live binder. And when you complete the survey, for today's show, at the bottom, you will find the request for a professional development certificate. You may ask for one of these, but please use a personal email address that you spell correctly uh, rather than a school email address because lots of schools will block this from being uh, sent back to you. The Archive collections are also available on iTunes U. There's a video collection and an audio collection. As well as the RSS feed link here on the uh, show's website. So there are many different ways to get the archives. Again, special thanks to Tony Plurd, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing the website, and as well as everyone who participated in today's show. Thank you all for coming. Hi, can you hear me? Sure can, Carolyn. Can you hear me? Okay, I wanted to <clears throat> tell everybody about the SanDisk wireless drive. I think I had first heard about it from Kathy Schrock on Twitter, but I don't see it much out there. What it is, is it's a very small wireless drive that is a USB drive. You can plug it into your computer. Uh, you also download the SanDisk wireless app for your iPad, your iPhone, it also works with Android. And once you've downloaded it, you connect, you go into your uh, wireless settings and you connect to the SanDisk 
drive instead of your wireless network. Although I understand you can be on both at the same time if you wish. But anyway, once you have connected to your SanDisk wireless drive, you go in and you say, I want to upload to the drive. And you can go to your iPad and uh, you choose the video folder or you can make a new folder. And you can simply upload from your iPad or your iPhone or your Android any of the videos that are on there to this wireless drive. And then you can take them off of your iPad. The really nice thing about the wireless drive is that if you wanted to show something to somebody on your iPad, for example, I actually plugged my wireless drive into my laptop computer and put a whole folder of photos from my laptop, it was several hundred megabytes, onto this drive. And then when I was in Camden, Maine, where I have no internet service, I was able to connect to the wireless drive and then show my aunt the pictures on the iPad from the drive. So that's what makes it even perhaps preferable to cloud storage in that you don't need a wireless. My one problem I had with the drive was I also had put some albums, uh, music, MP3s, albums onto the drive. But previously, you had to push the forward arrow to go from one selection to another. But in the latest uh, update to the app, they fixed that. So basically, that's what I want to say. And if there's anybody who has any uh, other questions, I'll get out of the mic now, but I will take them. Thank you. OK? Thank you, Carolyn. You're welcome. Again, thanks, everybody, for coming today. Remember, in order for that recording to process, everybody does have to leave the room.